Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. So welcome to the podcast as we move around the body and my name is Daisy Cunningham and I am the college's heritage manager and librarian. Um, And I'm Olivia Howitt and I am a volunteer with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh Heritage. And we have now made it as far as the ears. So I've been reading up a bit about ears, but I kind of went on a bit of a tangent down the the hearing route rather than the physical ears. And there's a lot written about the ear in the context of music, as in what music can do to you, you know, what it does to your health. So it dates back quite far, you know, back into the Middle Ages, the idea that music can improve your it's mostly mental health the kind of the melancholy the hysteria an edinburgh doctor william buchan wrote quite a bit about what music could do for you and notes that it can cure madness as he describes it but it can also help if you've got a bit of a headache or you're a bit tired and there's a lot about all different people trying to harness music so it's physicians it's philosophers it's church ministers all trying to treat through the medium of music one of my favourites is is Franz Mesmer, who you may have heard of, of mesmerism fame. And he thought you could control people through music. But then you have the opposite side. And this is why I think women must have been perpetually confused about what they were supposed to do, because music was recommended for women to treat them, to make them happier, to make them healthier. But also too much music could be dangerous. It could be too sensual. So I don't know what you were supposed to do to get it right if you were a woman. But it has always been thus, I I think, for for women particularly um, and maybe for everyone else as well. But then, like I was saying, you know, music is something that's viewed as sort of inherently civilized. And so music becomes a big part of what's called moral therapy, which is something that appears in the 1800s. It's particularly associated with asylums in Europe including in Britain, which is this sort of shift from asylums being places where you just keep people to asylums being places where you treat and try to cure people. It's called moral therapy. And so it's it's really about civilizing people. It's about taking people who are seen as sort of somehow savage and making them respectable Victorians. It's good because it's music therapy, which is certainly more pleasant than some of the awful things that were being done to people before but it's still it's got a very specific goal which is to make you into a respectable middle class person who does things in the right way I I think it's the performance aspect of it it feels very superficial it feels like as long as you look like you are a kind of quote unquote ordinary person then how you feel inside or what's Mm. happening within you doesn't really matter because you can do the performative dance yes And I think that is, it's just what's associated with Victorians. So, you know, the eugenics movement, Darwinism, you know, it's all tied in with colonialism, that there is a right and proper and civilised way of being. Is this the sort of same period where, I'm going to say it wrong, physiognomy? Physiognomy. Physiognomy. (laughs) Physiognomy. Where it had a little bit of a boom in terms of your appearance being indicative of your personality and your inherent character. Yes. Again, it's the sort of the pluses and the minuses in a way. So when when you look at illustrations of patients from earlier periods, they tend to be very generic types. You know, they'd be like, this is what a person with delirium looks like, but it's not a specific human being. It's sort of a caricature of a person in the medical text. And then you start seeing this is an illustration of John Smith, who has this disease, you know, so so they're looking at people as individuals more, which seems positive. But you're absolutely right. The kind of counterbalance to that is that they're going, look at the shape of this person's forehead, look at the shape of this person's nose looking at people both physically and internally I guess when you're talking about hearing and saying you know this is what is again I'm using the word very much in quote marks normal and othering people who are not 
And in terms of hearing, it then kind of leads on very much to people's approaches to deaf people. They, they're very focused on the idea of improving humanity or somehow sort of perfecting humanity. And if you don't have one of the five senses, then you are somehow viewed as sort of inferior. So there's a lot of focus on conformity. And I suppose if you were a, a deaf person at this time, there's a couple of things that you could do to sort of fit in or, or be accepted. And one of the things would be to make sure that people thought that you were not deaf from birth, because that was viewed very differently to if you had become deaf through some sort of accident or incident or something like that, whereas death from birth was viewed as being somehow sort of genetically problematic. The thing that made me particularly sad was that up to the Victorian era, there was a more positive view towards people who are deaf. And I'm not suggesting life was fantastic or perfect or anything like that, but there was um, a lot of people being intrigued in the Georgian period and before by sign language. People were interested in how it worked, how it developed. This kind of sign language culture, deaf culture, people wrote about it and were interested in it. You know, there were deaf schools that were created in the 1700s. There was one in Edinburgh, the Braidwood Academy, which was set up in the 1700s. You know, these places were cropping up all over the place. And then sort of the wall came down in the mid 1800s. You know, there was a real shift in attitude mm. and people were actively campaigning. You know, we don't want uh, sign language to be taught. We do not think that deaf schools should exist. People were very angry about it, which seems sort of like counterintuitive. You want to be able to communicate. Why would you not want to have people be taught how to communicate? They were viewed as these separate schools, this separate language. Somehow oh, it wow. was separating out from Britishness. So as a deaf person, you were supposed to learn to lip read. This was the perspective of, of the campaigners. You were supposed to try, whether through written word or through lip reading, to be part of the English language. And again, normal, I'm using that word a lot. I very much emphasise the quote marks, society. Very different to now, where people are more keen to get British Sign Language taught in schools across the board. Even when you see positive things about deaf people in the Victorian period, it tends to be very patronising. People to be, again, somehow sort of pitied rather than just respected. And the the idea of it's philanthropic to do that. You yes, are... aren't we kind people? <laughs> yes, um, <so. laughs> <laughs> rather than just accepting people into, you know, it, 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 as they are. And again, it's not deafness per se, it's how you became deaf that is important. So for some people, hearing aids are actually very middle class. You've probably seen these sort of hearing trumpets. And some of these are incredibly ornate, you know, made of silver. They're all engraved. They're fantastic. Um, <laughs> obviously only accessible if you have a certain amount of money and you live a certain sort of lifestyle where you can realistically have a hearing trumpet for when you're at the opera and a separate hearing trumpet for in your sort of drawing room. But it's also, again, it's how it came about. The idea being that you had 100% perfect hearing throughout your life. Now you are old and you cannot hear very well and that's fine. That's different from it being genetic um, in terms of how people perceive it. I did hear that the king of Portugal in the early 1800s had a throne made. It was like an acoustic chair, so it would work in the same way as an ear trumpet. Yeah, I didn't know about that, but I did see some things about um, you could get one in the shape of a vase. You could get them built into church pews, you know, so there was quite a oh, lot wow. of ingenuity and aesthetics sort of built into this. had some interesting facts about tinnitus oh for for anyone that doesn't know tinnitus is when you hear ringing in your ears that doesn't come from an external source it's not a modern condition the egyptians called it a bewitched ear they had treatments that involved putting oils and mixtures through a reed into your external ear canal which sadly did not work. And then the ancient Assyrians defined three different kinds of tinnitus. There's whispering, speaking and singing ears. The The one thing that came up quite a lot was that um, there were some medieval Welsh physicians who recommend their recommendation for tinnitus was to 
take a, a freshly baked loaf of bread, cut it in half and put it on each ear. So I think the heat was intended to help with, with the tinnitus. I read enough horrendous recipes <laughs> that the idea of putting bread on your ear actually seems pretty pleasant. Lots of early physicians thought that tinnitus was caused by wind trapped inside your ear. So I'm not sure if there was quite a lot of efforts to untrap the wind by perforating something. Yeah. Icky. (laughs) I've got one which is also somewhat icky. It depends if you're a cat person. I am very much a cat person. So I didn't particularly like this, but I'd like to emphasize before I say this, that this is a hypothetical thing that has never actually been done, as far as we know. But this German physician, I think it was in the 1500s, he invented this imaginary, what he called a cat organ. Now, the idea was you had a row of cats sitting there and each cat, in turn, you pulled its tail so that it made a squeaking noise. Now, he said this was an ideal treatment for people who had short attention spans, that if they couldn't focus on things, what you would do is you'd put them in a room with a cat organ, pull all the cat's tails, and he said it would cure their lack of attention forever i do not fully understand how that would work (laughs) but as i say it sounds pretty unpleasant for the cats but uh, it doesn't seem to have ever actually been done it was sort of an intellectual exercise i that sounds like he was just like a really big fan of cats and wanted to be in a room with lots of them (laughs) (laughs) It does feel like it's so abstract as a theory it may not have been useful. I mean, it would get my attention. Definitely. Definitely. It would definitely get the cat's attention. (laughs) For our case study today, we're going to look at music as a form of therapeutics, and specifically the use of music by the Georgian quack, James Graham. Graham has the remarkable accolade of having his occupation on Wikipedia listed as sexologist. Graham was born in Edinburgh's Cowgate. He studied medicine at the University of Edinburgh, although he never graduated. In his early career, Graham worked on the Royal Mile in Edinburgh's Old Town, selling miracle cures for every ailment, alongside street performers, chapbook sellers and sketch artists. But Graham was too big for Edinburgh, and he moved to London where he set up three different so-called temples of healing, each of which was successively less opulent as his cash ran out. But he worked hard to promote himself, producing pamphlets and writing books. Music, the way Graham used it, was part of a number of treatments or stimulants that produced a particular ambience. The late 1700s saw a rise of opulent theatrical or performative medicine. This included sounds, smells, and often electricity. And Graham was at the centre of this consumerist medicine movement. The public paid to enter his temples, and women were offered masks to protect their identities. These temples could supposedly cure a wide range of diseases, but particular emphasis was placed on impotence and infertility, and within the temple they could listen to music, wander through ornately furnished rooms with marble pillars and blood-red walls, and hear Graham delivering lectures on health while watching topless young women pose around the various statues. There were enormous conductors in each room, with brass pipes and rods weaving throughout. Graham described the overall feeling as womb-like. In addition to the music, treatments included milk baths, massages, electrical cures, and the temple centrepiece was the celestial bed. It was about 15 foot square and raised on glass pillars and linked up to magnets and electrical machines. The bed had mirrors, erotic paintings, perfume and flashing electrical lights to get you in the mood, and the music's tempo increased in accordance supposedly with the guest's passion. Graham charged £50 a night, which is somewhere in the region of about £3,000 today, to use the bed, and it supposedly cured impotence and sterility. Sightseers who visited the temple included the politician Horace Walpole. In London, Graham was described in the press as the Prince of the Quacks. He didn't last long, and was forced to sell up because of debts. This was one of the problems with being a quack. 
If you were successful, you could become very fashionable. But the problem, of course, with being fashionable is that you then become unfashionable as people lose interest in the novelty. Graham became an itinerant quack, travelling from town to town, selling his wares. Eventually he gave up and returned to Edinburgh, where he tried very hard to re-establish himself, but without success, and he was buried in an unmarked grave in Greyfriars Kirkyard. In this short clip, Dr James Kennaway talks about the perils of piano playing in 19th century Britain. On the one side a respectable middle class pastime, and on the other a source of concern, with medical discussions about the dangers of excessive music in young women's education. There was a serious medical discussion about the dangers of excessive music in girls' education. Although some prominent medical critics of female education paid little attention to music, or in fact regarded it as a very respectable accomplishment for girls, many of the area's leading psychiatrists and gynaecologists argued that music could not only excite the imagination, but also overstimulate the nervous system directly, playing havoc with vulnerable female nerves and reproductive organs, and warned of the consequences of music lessons on the developing bodies of teenage girls. In so doing, they created a serious medical counterpart to the discussion of what the critic Edward Hanslick was famous critic of the 19th century called the Clavier Zeuche, the piano plague. So, the domestic piano player is the key image, perhaps, of the female musician in the 19th century, just sitting at home playing the piano by herself. And private music making in the home was generally regarded as an especially female activity. Indeed, from the 18th century, playing the keyboard at home had become a central part of the habitus of female gentility. If you wanted to really prove that you were firmly in the middle classes, learning to play the piano was a pretty good way of going about it, it still is. Um, in contrast to the widespread hostility shown towards women who were involved in public life as intellectuals as blue stockings, this private musical sphere was on the whole eminently respectable. Certain female professional musicians, such as Clara Schumann, even found a place in the 19th century concert world, but it should be noted they were tolerated only within limits, with only with certain instruments, especially things like the piano, and not expected to have any success at composition. On the one hand, music was seen as a, f a sensual feminine art, on the other hand, composition and serious musicianship were regarded as a heroic masculine business. In his 1871 uh, system of hygiene, the German physician and noted medical opponent of music, Edward Reich, who is um, just a perfect a gold mine of fantastic quotes because he only ever says ridiculous things, he went to so, so far as to suggest that the erotic effect of music could have startling consequences for young women. He wrote, the relationship between music and sex life, and especially menstruation, is hardly ever mentioned. Not true. He lamented, excessive music causes significant excitation of the whole nervous system and especially the imagination. And this can lead in more than a few cases to premature awakening of the sex drive and the premature start of menstruation. Nor did he regard this as a minor issue. It could, he wrote, lead to passions, despair, suicide, vice, crime, madness, melancholy and hysteria. The dangers of such, he seriously, again, suggested banning immoral music on public health grounds. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today. So it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. Ears came in for a range of treatments to treat bruising, ulceration, deafness, ringing in the ears, objects stuck in the ears, swelling and just general pain. The treatment in one Scottish printed recipe book dating from 1731 for what it called filthy mattering ears was, quote, hot urine of a child infused into the ears. The rest of that recipe was a little better though, containing egg yolk, bitter almonds, mint, hemp and fig milk. Another recipe from the same book, this time for stones or grains in the ear, recommended quote, to cause a man breathe into his ear strongly and on a sudden draw in his breath again, hold the mouth and the nose close and provoke sneezing, or put turpentine or glue upon the end of a staff and put it into the ear and draw them out therewith. <laughs> 
for swelling of the ears, there is the ever-present goat stung. And uh, honestly, it feels sometimes like goat stung. There's nothing that it can't cure, um, along with barley, honey, and vinegar. What was called deafness in these recipe books was usually something which is viewed as temporary or curable, involving things like turpentine drops in the ear or a sponge applied to the ear. Other recipes recommended that you, quote, hang down that side of the head and hop upon the foot of the same side, or put in a hollow quill into the ear and suck it out. The same recipe goes on to say that fleas are drawn forth with dog's hair, and also that fasting spittle or your own urine dropped into the ear will kill anything living in them. Another supposed recipe for deafness was to, quote, take a loaf of ordinary bread from the oven, take away the lower crust and dip it in alcohol. Apply it to the ear as hot as may be suffered. The same recipe also says that, quote, ants' eggs mixed with the juice of an onion and dropped into the ear doth cure the oldest deafness. But possibly the most unsettling, or at least the most detailed, is this treatment for deafness from the same 1731 book, quote, take the gall of a ram, or if that cannot be had, of any other sheep, and strain from it the clear liquor, till it come to the greenish, which cast away, then take the aforesaid liquor, and with it, with an equal quantity of brandy, put them in a glass, and pour a little into the patient's ear. This is to be done several times, then to make use of fumes of tobacco. For pain of the ears, treatments included bloodletting and breast milk squirted directly into the ear. Women's milk is a recurring treatment for ear pain, and features alongside fox grease, a mouse bruised in wine, the fat of bacon, fox lights, which means fox eyes, earthworms and mustard. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage, and we have a Just Giving page, RCPE Heritage, linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you.